So welcome back for one last time, my friends, to HS211, History of the Restoration Movement. In this final course lecture, we will discuss the life of a man named J.W. McGarvey, or John W. McGarvey, a man at the forefront of the non-instrumental controversy, and also at the rise of the liberalism controversy that we discussed earlier in the week. Now, in many ways, McGarvey serves as an anecdotal snapshot for why the Disciples of Christ and the non-instrumental churches of Christ split in the early 1900s. And this split is complicated, but largely came about because of a clash of biblical interpretation, a theme that's driven this course throughout. So, if you're ready, let's hit the road one last time, and we'll discuss the lifetimes and impact of J.W. McGarvey upon the Restoration Movement. So, let's back up just for a second, and let's review the all the controversies we discussed over the last two weeks, because it will help to explain why the Restoration Movement divided into three parts. And so, let's begin with the outbreak of the Civil War, which prompted numerous armed and even pacifistic responses from individuals affiliated within the movement. In particular, the American Christian Missionary Society, when it passed its loyalty resolutions, it drove a fairly significant wedge between congregations in the North and South that were affiliated with the Restoration Movement. And in the years following the Civil War, we then have the musical instrument controversy, which made the divide between North and South liturgically distinct, as each group developed their own unique forms of worship. And once you add to that the rise of liberalism, starting in the 1800s going all the way through the 1920s, this divide gets wider, and it creates an educational rift between the progressive and conservative arms of the movement. And... As these divides grow and grow, we're going to see three identifiable factions emerge. The non-instrumental Christian churches, the independent Christian churches, Churches of Christ, and the Disciples of Christ. And so I hope the irony of all this is not lost on you by this juncture in our semester. The Restoration Movement was an association that started out as a plea for Christian unity, and itself it divided into partisan groups and they these groups are separated by hermeneutics and ideological lines and if the 1830s when we had the union of the stone and the campbell movements was the high point of christian cooperation under this bible alone idea the 1890s through the 1920s saw a slow but steady fracturing of this unity like many relationships, the union came fairly quickly and easily when the Stone and Campbell movements realized they had something in common. But the breakup took a while longer to become reality and, like all breakups, was extremely complicated. And seemingly in the middle of all this is a man named John W. McGarvey. So this will serve as our focus person of interest for the lecture today. So we may rightly ask the question, why focus on McGarvey when there are so many other colorful personas we could be studying as well? And my answer for that is pretty simple. By focusing on McGarvey, we can get a very long-lived snapshot. In fact, he's going to live 82 years, and it's because of this longevity that we're going to that he'll be able to have seen three generations of restoration movement figures. When he started in his youth, he studied under Thomas and Alexander Campbell and learned their educational methods and their style of biblical studies. As a middle-aged adult, he had to deal with the Civil War and the problems of the missionary society and the tension over musical instruments. And then later in his life, he actively rejected the developing liberal ideas of biblical studies, and he sought for a more conservative Bible-alone hermeneutic. And so... Long story short, McGarvey got to see almost everything that we've discussed up to this date, and he becomes a pretty interesting figure because he had something to say on all of it. Now, the second reason I've chosen McGarvey is that he genuinely attempted to heal many of these rifts within the movement. He realized there was a problem and that he had to do something. So, he encouraged things like pacifism and forbearance during the Civil War, he did not initially break over the musical instrument question, and even though he himself was vehemently opposed to musical instruments. However, like William Gary, he still had an essentials list. 
And for McGarvey, the essential aspect of the Restoration Movement for him was its Bible alone hermeneutic and its strict constructualist interpretation of that. And because of the rise of liberal scholarship, it seemingly threatened the validity of this hermeneutic. And McGarvey will spend the majority of his life academically fighting such scholars as H.L. Willett and W.E. Garrison and trying to bring the movement closer to a conservative point of view. So, in short, McGarvey serves as an appropriate example of how these twin concerns of our class, Christian unity and biblical truth, came into conflict time and time again. So let's begin with some preliminary facts about McGarvey's life, which began in 1829 in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Like many people born on the American frontier, McGarvey had a very large family. His father passed away when he was about four years old, and his mother remarried fairly quickly and then moved the whole family to Tremont, Illinois. And between McGarvey's natural siblings, his half-brothers and sisters, his stepbrothers and sisters, there's 19 total kids and 21 total people in McGarvey's family. Now, the Tremont home where they lived is relatively small for a family of 20-plus people, so it is fairly unsurprising that at the age of 18, McGarvey decided to leave home and travel to West Virginia, or more appropriately, Western Virginia, since it hadn't split at the time, to go to college. Next, in 1847, McGarvey finally makes it to Bethany College, and of course, as we know, this is the place where Alexander Campbell and his friends like Robert Milligan are teaching. And McGarvey's going to learn Campbell's paradigm of pursuing a classical or liberal arts education. Now, just really quick, I should note that this should not be confused with the ideas of liberalism, as we discussed in the previous lecture, which tends to question many of the traditional beliefs about the Bible, Christianity, and human origins, etc., etc. A liberal arts education, on the other hand, is a language-focused education. And it comes with the understanding that a person who has access to languages will be able to study the widest possible set of disciplines. In particular, McGarvey is going to study mathematics, history, and the Greek and Latin languages. He didn't officially study the Bible or Hebrew while he was at Bethany, and many times he lamented this missed opportunity later in life. Now, after one year of study at Bethany, McGarvey was baptized by Alexander Campbell's son-in-law, W.K. Pendleton, and to me this indicates that he was not officially affiliated with the Restoration Movement before he had arrived at Bethany. And I find this to be important because McGarvey's reliance on Alexander Campbell's New Testament-only hermeneutic is a lifelong commitment. But it was a hermeneutic that he picked up at Bethany. It didn't come to him on its own. So in short, all of the traditions McGarvey acquired from his teachers, the historical critical approach to reading the Bible, became a staple of his theology. And I think this helps explain why McGarvey so frequently had disagreements with scholars such as H.L. Willett and Hiram Van Kirk later in his life, who did not necessarily share these basic presuppositions that he did. Next, after graduating from Bethany, McGarvey moved to Fayette, Missouri, so that he could be closer to his family. His family had apparently moved from Illinois to Missouri sometime during his college career. Now, once he's in Missouri, he began working as a preacher for a local Disciples of Christ church, and he also worked as a teacher of students to the Fayette community. And within a few years, the elders of the Fayette church, particularly two uh, men by the name of Alexander Proctor and T.M. Allen, will ordain McGarvey to the ministry. Now, McGarvey's going to serve in Missouri for about 12 years, and his status as a successful teacher and preacher will not go unnoticed. In particular, Alexander Campbell and Robert Milliken will both invite McGarvey, please return to, to Bethany so that you can teach mathematics. And it's notable to me that in all of these cases, he will turn them down. But in turning them down, it doesn't mean that he didn't have some higher aspirations. And by 1853, McGarvey's going to make two very notable life transitions. The first, he's going to marry a woman by the name of Otwiana Hicks, who is the daughter of a prominent 
uh, Fayetteville, uh, or sorry, Fayette businessman by the name of Otway Hicks. Um, and in McGarvey's own autobiography, which was edited by Dwight E. Stevenson, he's going to record <clears throat> that him and his new wife planned to go on their honeymoon to Louisville so that they could attend a convention where they would discuss the plans for the revised edition of the King James Version of the Bible. And while I admit this is not the most romantic sounding getaway to be sure, it shows just how interested McGarvey is in the disciplines of Bible translation and textual criticism or lower biblical criticism even earlier in his career. And a second notable change for McGarvey this year is that while he's at that convention, he's going to meet several prominent associate or restoration movement thinkers, such as John T. Johnson, Tolbert Fanning, and Ben Franklin. And in particular, his f friendship with Franklin is going to be important because he's going to start writing articles for Franklin's journal, which is known as the American Christian Review. And these regular writing assignments with Franklin's periodical are going to give McGarvey plenty of practice at writing at the popular level. And the result of all this is that seven years later, by 1860, McGarvey will publish his first full book, which is a commentary on the Book of Acts. And for me, it's notable that McGarvey's Acts commentary is hugely focused on the original Greek grammar of the text, which implies that to understand this Bible book, the most important tool at a reader's disposal is access to the meaning of the original Greek words. And furthermore, modern scholars such as Eugene Boring note that McGarvey's work on the Book of Acts will pave the way for the conservative branches of the movement to view the Book of Acts as the most important book of the Bible, a canon within the biblical canon, if you will. And this tendency to appeal to the Book of Acts as a superlative scripture is a common tendency among Restoration Movement churches and colleges even to this day. Now, in 1860, the w Civil War is going to break out, and McGarvey will move much closer to the North-South action by taking a ministry post at Main Street Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky. And this close proximity to the fighting during the Civil War will have a profound effect on McGarvey, just as it influenced other Southern Restoration Movement advocates such as David Lipscomb and Tolbert Fanning. But what I would like to do, though, is shift gears here and point out some of McGarvey's important beliefs. Just like Campbell and Burnett and other persons of interest that we've studied in this class, it's not my goal to give a definitive list of everything McGarvey believed. Instead, I'm hoping to give a reasonable sample of his ideas to best explain why he acted the way that he did throughout his life, and why did he choose certain issues to become lifelong theological battlegrounds. And so, the first McGarvey doctrine I want to look at is his pacifism. Just like Moses Lard, David Lipscomb, and Tolbert Fanning, McGarvey was deeply opposed to Christians being involved in the Civil War for reasons that we've already explored last week. Following Lipscomb, though, McGarvey understood that one central identity was to be found in the church and in Christ himself. And for a Christian to go to war over a lesser cause or a lesser identity, such as the institution of slavery or even pride of nationalism, was to betray a first principle, Christ. And to this end, his question of citizenship was always subservient to his identity in Christ. And as his letter to Benjamin Franklin states, quote, whether I remain a citizen of the Union or become a citizen of the Southern Confederacy, my feelings towards the brethren everywhere shall know no change, unquote. Again, I think this shows just his commitment to the idea that as a Christian, this identity extended even far beyond his notions of nationality. And I would also say that this is interesting because McGarvey was far from having an opinion on the matter. He was a very vocal sympathizer of the South. And so McGarvey's motion at the American Christian Missionary Society is telling to me in this regard. When the Northern Christians are calling the Southern War an action that needed to be denounced, they used this term, they wanted to call it an attempt at rebellion. 
But McGarvey opted for a more softer and more palatable language, saying that the Southern War should be called an attempt at revolution. And so notice the difference here. If you call it a rebellion, you can use the rhetoric of, say, like a biblical text like Romans 13 and say it's evil. However, if you call it a revolution, that language becomes patriotic. It's simply following in the footsteps of great American forefathers from the late 1700s. And I particularly find such word wrangling by McGarvey to be interesting. Looking back on it in our own day and age, as many people are becoming quite aware of just how word choice can put a particular political spin on an idea, making it easier or harder to digest. In short, people have been choosing their words and creating pop propaganda for centuries, attempting to convince others of an idea or to do something the same way that they do. And McGarvey is certainly aware of this and is wanting to spin the Southern War in a positive light. Now, additionally, McGarvey was one of the few Southern sympathizers who was initially on board with the American Christian Missionary Society. However, once the resolutions are passed and the South is denounced, McGarvey will begin to denounce the power that the society has to even make such a proclamation, and he's going to push for congregationally sponsored missions afterward. So, in addition to his politics, McGarvey also felt very strongly against the use of musical instruments in a Christian worship service. Like David Lipscomb, Moses Lard, and Benjamin Franklin, McGarvey is going to apply a strict constructionist hermeneutic when he reads the New Testament. He's not going to find an explicit command to use musical instruments in a Christian assembly, and therefore he's going to conclude that musical instruments don't have a place in Christian worship. Now, what I find interesting about all this is that McGarvey's stance on musical instruments is that he is not going to suggest to separate from other Christians over this issue. And certainly people like David Lipscomb and Moses Lard did think it was a separation-worthy problem. So, much like McGarvey's writings where he promoted pacifism, he seems pretty intent here on not letting a idea of temporary concern, such as a musical instrument or a war, get in the way of the movement's higher plea to Christian unity. However, I also need to note, McGarvey's stance uh, became uh, pretty soft there once he was no longer in power. You see, as long as he was in power over the church uh, that he was preaching at, there was really no real danger of musical instruments being introduced. But by 1902, McGarvey's no longer the preaching minister at the what will then be the Broadway church, and the congregation is going to move to start using the organ, and as a result, McGarvey will quietly move out. And so all of this is to say that for him, the call for Christian unity began to be strained the more and more things that he disapproved of began to move in and become common fixtures of Restoration Movement churches. And this has been a common theme throughout our study of the Restoration Movement. As many of the leaders of the movement were on board with the concept of Christian unity, believing that others would read the Bible in the exact same way they did, well, when this didn't happen, and as in the case of McGarvey, where people in his own church were even disagreeing on the issue, the issue of musical instruments, the idea of Christian unity becomes much less important. And the idea of proving one's biblical authority becomes more important. So next, another major belief that McGarvey held to was the notion of the plenary verbal inspiration of scripture. Simply put, there are many theories concerning the methods that God used to inspire the Bible authors to write down their books of scripture, and the plenary verbal theory has been a particularly popular theory among Protestants in general, and evangelical Christians in particular. Now, while this discussion of inspiration theories could be a class all of itself and we simply don't have time for it, I need to make a few observations about the plenary verbal theory to help explain McGarvey's constant fight against liberalism that he undertook later in his life. And the first observation is this, that while texts like 2 Timothy 3.16 affirm that scriptures are God-breathed, that they come from God, it doesn't explain 
how they came from God. The plenary verbal theory suggests that God's inspiration of the scripture influences the very grammar and word choice of the biblical authors. Every word choice is important in this theory, and every piece of grammar and syntax matters. But notice this, the conclusions of the plenary verbal theory are still an interpretation of the scriptures. The scriptures just say, the word of God is God breathed. The plenary verbal theory states, and by that we mean that God has affected the grammar and the syntax of the words the Bible author has used. The term plenary verbal inspiration also never appears in the Bible, and thus it fails the basic restoration movement plea that we need to call Bible things by their Bible names. And many of McGarvey's opponents, who will profess a different view of how the scriptures are inspired, will see this as an attack from McGarvey, as McGarvey will see their views as an attack on the scriptures themselves. And my second observation is this, that the scriptures themselves never make an official internal canonical list of biblical authors. For example, you just can't go to the book of Deuteronomy and say, what are the books of Moses? Or we can't go to Revelation and say, what are the books of the New Testament? The Bible never explicitly states which books belong in the Bible. And as many of McGarvey's opponents will start to question these Jewish and Christian traditions of biblical authorship and notions of biblical canon, McGarvey will begin to retaliate vehemently, arguing that the traditions of biblical authorship, date, and canon are correct. Now, my assessment of all this is that two major restoration movement priorities are getting pulled in opposite directions and are coming into direct conflict. On the one hand, the primitivism of the Restoration Movement relied on the notion that we need to eliminate all man-made traditions. On the other hand, the Bible-only hermeneutic was the expected means of replacing those man-made traditions with God's will. However, as liberal biblical scholarship developed, these two ideas become more and more in conflict as the philosophy of plenary verbal inspiration and the tradition of the 66-book Protestant canon are both post-biblical developments. McGarvey chose to defend those developments while his opponents did not, but at the end of the day, these sides are now arguing theology. They're not arguing what does the Bible explicitly state. So, moving on with McGarvey's life events, once the Civil War ended, McGarvey entered his teaching phase of his life. And specifically, in 1865, John Brian Bowman is going to help to merge the University of Kentucky with Transylvania University, which was in Eastern Kentucky, and it's gonna make it the largest school in the state, and he's gonna move that whole institution to the city of Lexington, Kentucky. And McGarvey will be offered the post of Professor of Sacred History, and he's gonna hold this position all the way until 1911 when he died. And this teaching position gave McGarvey a platform for disseminating many of his ideas so many of the third and fourth generation Restoration Movement preachers are going to come through his teaching office, and they'll consider it a mark of status to say, I've taken a course with James W. McGarvey. Sorry, John W. McGarvey. And so, with his teaching and preaching career in place, McGarvey began to look into publishing a periodical of his own. After all, the publications of many popular level religious magazines were the most common way of establishing communication and widespread leadership throughout the Restoration Movement. And the two most popular ma magazines after the Civil War, The Christian Standard and The Gospel Advocate, were largely viewed as sectarian journals, meaning that they appealed to either the North or the Southern branches of the movement, respectively. And working with the likes of Moses Lard, W. H. Hobson, and L. B. Wilkins, McGarvey tried to publish a more middle-of-the-road journal, one that would appeal to both northern and southern readers. And to this end, uh, the bipartisan journal known as the Apostolic Times was created. However, it didn't attract a very wide readership, and after a, a mere eight years, it folded. <laughs> 
So shortly after starting the Apostolic Times in 1869, McGarvey also participated in a church plant in 1870. He's going to move from his first church in Lexington, Kentucky, and he's going to start a second Disciples of Christ church known as the Broadway Christian Church. And he's going to serve as both the preacher and elder of this church until 1902. And it's at this time when the musical instrument controversy becomes big in his church, and he's going to leave and seek out a local non-instrumental congregation. And again, I believe this event shows just how serious the instrument controversy was in the minds of some Restoration Movement adherents, even in such a person like McGarvey, who generally touted the ideas of Christian forbearance. But, you know, he worked at this church for 32 years. And then, over the instrument controversy, that was the final straw. And Speaking of breaking fellowship, in 1873, just eight years after coming aboard as professor at the College of the Bible, which is, again, in the University of Kentucky, McGarvey will be fired after he had a falling out with the university's president, John Bowman. So for about two years, McGarvey didn't teach at the College of the Bible, and their attendance numbers drastically fell from 122 to 35. And this indicates two things for me. One, as a positive, McGarvey was a good enough teacher that he was able to get his job back at the College of the Bible because the college realized it is financially lucrative to keep this man on staff because students will come to him. As a negative, it shows that McGarvey is able to build somewhat of a cult of personality around his teaching so that for nearly a hundred college students, the decision whether to stay or leave was based on, is McGarvey there? In short, McGarvey's going to be one of the first what I'll call professor bishops of the Restoration Movement. In many generations before McGarvey, publishers of periodicals wield enormous power over the movement. But with the advent of professors like McGarvey, now college professors, those who teach biblical studies and theology, will also begin to wield enormous power over the movement. And here's how they do it. They train the bulk of the preachers and evangelists who will then go out and serve in the local churches. Indeed, many of McGarvey's students, they'll look back on their time with McGarvey as a teacher very fondly and say, how do you know I'm an Orthodox preacher? I studied under McGarvey. Now, in addition, we should also note that probably McGarvey's most successful scholarly pursuit began in 1879 when McGarvey traveled to Palestine for six months and he produced a textbook on the geography and topography of the lands of the Bible. And this is a pretty groundbreaking textbook, and it's going to be his longest-lasting academic legacy, as countless other researchers and publishers are going to see the benefit of McGarvey's work, and they will begin producing their own maps and Bible atlases. And so, for those of you who have taken the Bible backgrounds class here at Mid-Atlantic, you can thank McGarvey. He's the one who started the trend that geography and map work is a com crucial component of biblical studies. So once McGarvey got to the age of the late 50s, early 60s in his life, the problem of liberalism within the Restoration Movement became very apparent to him. And so beginning in 1886, again, when Mar McGarvey's in his late 50s, he'll begin writing uh, apologetic works that to combat the rise of liberalism. And in particular, his two-volume work, Evidences of Christianity, was aimed at debunking many of the claims of modernist biblical scholarship. And so, a few years later, in 1863, he began writing a popular-level column for the Cincinnati-based periodical The Christian Standard, and his po point was to inform these local readers of the dangers of biblical criticism that's going on in the colleges and universities. And for me, it's no coincidence that this is also corresponding to the times when the University of Chicago is just getting underway. That as this liberalism is growing in Chicago, it's also growing as a reaction from McGarvey to fight it. And what's interesting to me is that when the Restoration Movement first began, the discipline of lower biblical criticism was a fairly new idea, but most of the first generation adherents were on board with this idea. And they were on board specifically with the idea that in order to read the Bible correctly, we need to make sure we have the right biblical text. 
and if the text may contain errors, it is the job of the biblical critic to make sure which texts actually belong in the Bible and which ones have been added later. And if you want to see how this kind of a study plays out today, simply look up a text like John 8, 1 through 11, or Acts 8, 37 in a study Bible, and you'll note the textual problems that passages like these possess. Now, as the new generations start carrying on the work of higher biblical criticism, people after Alexander Campbell and the like, they'll begin questioning many of the Bible's authorship traditions. And now the Restoration Movement finds itself at a crossroads. Would they continue their tradition of supporting liberal scholarship, which they did in the first couple of generations, but now that that scholarship is beginning to challenge the movement's basic hermeneutical presupposition, what will they do? And for McGarvey, the answer is a definite no. We will no longer support this liberal scholarship. And as a result, a theological split between conservative disciples who denounced biblical criticism and liberals who supported it is going to grow. And that divide is going to get wider and wider as the years go by. Now, McGarvey didn't live long enough to actually see the split become a reality, which happened in 1926. The, the conservative uh, will end up branching off from the disciples and they'll form a new group, which is commonly known as the Independent Christian Church, Churches of Christ. But for where McGarvey's concerned, biblical criticism is not just wrong, it's a heresy. For the more biblical scholars, or sorry, the more liberal scholars begin to promote this growing field of higher biblical criticism, the more vocal and mean-spirited McGarvey's going to become. And so in short, McGarvey proved that even the conservatives of the Restoration Movement did in fact had a, have a creed. It was a simple creed, but it was this. I believe the Bible, and I believe the traditions of plenary verbal inspiration associated with it. So keep all this in mind, at the same time that the University of Chicago is founding the Disciples' Divinity House in 1894, and it's also embracing theological liberalism, McGarvey is at the College of the Bible, which is a subsidiary school of the University of Kentucky, and it's embracing theological conservatism. And a year later, in 1895, McGarvey's going to become president of the College of the Bible, and he's going to use his considerable influence to ensure that liberalism will not be taught there while he's president. Interestingly, a year after McGarvey's death, the College of the Bible did begin to embrace more liberal scholarship, which will then prompt the creation of many competing conservative Bible colleges over the next 50 years. Mid-Atlantic Christian University, by the way, formerly known as Roanoke Bible College, was founded as part of this reactionary movement. As most of the major universities began to embrace liberal theological scholarship, more conservative Bible colleges will begin cropping up all over the country to offer a more orthodox expression of biblical And so I'd like to conclude this discussion on McGarvey by showing how this issue of conservative versus liberal scholarship played out in the real world. And we'll be, do this by looking at an issue known as the Hiram Van Kirk Affair. And this event, in my opinion, shows just how far McGarvey was willing to go to destroy theological liberalism. And so th that story begins in the year 1900, when a young Restoration Movement scholar by the name of Hiram Van Kirk graduated from the University of Chicago with his doctorate. He moved to Berkeley, California, and he begins teaching at a place called Berkeley Bible Seminary, which is a school affiliated with the Restoration Movement. Now, as you were going through this, keep all this information in mind. Hiram Van Kirk works and ministers two time zones away from J.W. McGarvey. And theoretically, McGarvey should have no say over Van Kirk's teaching, since all Restoration Movement churches are autonomous, as are their schools. If Van Kirk was morally or theologically in the wrong, Going by Restoration Movement standards, it should be the elders of his local church who will say, Van Kirk, cut it out, not McGarvey. So keep that in mind, because in 1902, McCar McGarvey is going to call for Van Kirk to be fired from the Berkeley Bible Seminary, and all of this because a single student left the Restoration Movement and became a Unitarian. 
And by the way, a Unitarian is just a form of universalism. Now, it should be important to note here that Van Kirk denied that he ever taught liberalism, and he rejected the claim that the young student who left the Restoration Movement because of his teaching was his fault. And yet, McGarvey continued to attack him by writing negatively about Van Kirk in the Christian Standard Periodical. And McGarvey eventually called for people to come out all the way to California and investigate the matter. And so, for nearly two years, Van Kirk is going to receive considerable abuse from McGarvey and his supporters in written form. And, well, two years later, that investigation will take place, and they're going to say the accusation was baseless. Van Kirk will be cleared on all charges. And the Christian Standard will publish a very small single paragraph to apologize to Van Kirk and, quote, consider the matter closed, unquote. And it's also notable to me that that apology never came from McGarvey. McGarvey was pretty convinced Van Kirk was the problem. And so I used this incident to show just how big the divide between liberals and conservatives had become, where people like McGarvey would sacrifice even Restoration Movement ideas, such as congregational autonomy, in order pr to protect his own interpretations of the Bible traditions, specifically the plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture. And so, in short, the split between the movement was already there during the time of McGarvey as early as the 1900s, even though it wouldn't become official until 1926. And so, with this, the movement spawns three distinct movements. The, Disci the Disciples of Christ, which will follow the path of theological liberalism, they'll embrace the unity aspects of the Restoration Movement, and eventually they'll be reorganized as a full-blown denomination in 1968. And so I use this incident to show just how big the divide between liberals and conservatives had become, where people like McGarvey could sacrifice a restoration movement ideal, this notion that congregational autonomy is a biblical idea, in order that he can protect an interpretation of the Bible i.e. the plenary verbal inspiration theory. In short, the split within the movement is already there even during the time of McGarvey in the early 1900s. It won't become official until 1926, but it's already there early on. And so with this, I simply need to conclude the Restoration Movement spawns three distinct groups. The first group, the Disciples of Christ, is going to follow down this path of theological liberalism. They'll embrace the unity aspects of the movement, and they'll eventually become reorganized as a full denomination in 1968. The second group to come out of this will be the non-instrumental Churches of Christ. This group is going to embrace a strict constructionist view of the Bible, and they'll remain a viable collection of independent churches located mostly in the American South and Midwest. And the third group, known generally as the Independent Christian Churches, Churches of Christ, is going to embrace a more loose constructionist view of the Bible, but still cling to plenary verbal inspiration. And this group has since become the largest of the three groups that have come from the Restoration Movement in the United States today. Now, with regards to the results from this whole Van Kirk affair, I'd like to note that four distinct things kind of emerge from this and as these things emerge the rift between the conservatives and and the liberal disciples is going to grow wider and wider and the first is that these groups are just going to become more aggressive in attacking one another mcgarvey's going to set the precedent that someone should get fired if they're teaching the wrong kind of theology and in short order, both conservatives and liberals are going to begin taking stabs at professors they don't like, trying to get them fired from their teaching posts. And sad to say, this trend continues even today in Restoration Movement colleges, where a person will hear, this teacher is teaching so-and-so, and will attempt to get them fired, regardless of whether it's true or not. And a second kind of trend that comes from this is that scholars will frequently be labeled as either conservative or liberal based upon the schools where they attended. 
I know many scholars within the Restoration Movement today who either get or lose teaching positions simply based upon the schools where they attended. In fact, the reason you're hearing my voice right now is because I had the luck of attending a fairly conservative school and Mid-Atlantic hires conservative teachers. A third thing is that the liberal side of uh, the Restoration Movement is going to begin embracing the unity aspects much more forcibly, whereas conservatives will begin focusing on the Bible-only and Orthodox teaching aspects. And so as time progresses, the liberal sides of the movement, which will eventually form the Disciples of Christ, are going to become more universalist in scope. And they're not going to cling to many things that evangelicals would say are fundamentals of the Christian faith. Likewise, the more conservatives are going to cling to a Bible-only and sometimes even a strict constructionist view of reading the Bible, and they'll become more and more isolated, that they'll have more in common with the very conservative forms of evangelicalism, but they'll become more and more distant from other more established groups of Christianity, like the Presbyterians, like the Methodists. And so what we're going to see is the development of two main groups of Christians in America, evangelicals and what are called mainline denominations. And these conservatives will focus less and less on the unity principle and more and more on the question of how is the Bible rightly interpreted. And a fourth trend that I'd like to note is that both sides are going to claim they are studying and respecting the Bible. The liberals are going to say, this is exactly what Alexander Campbell and his folk would have done if they had lived in our day and age. Likewise, the conservatives are, will say, no, he would have followed us. And so, like many things, this will be played out in America over and over again where both people on the liberal and the conservative end of the spectrum will appeal to some kind of founding father and say, he would have followed us if he had lived today. And of course, this is an argument from silence. But both groups are going to do this. They're going to claim, to respect the Bible, you do biblical studies our way. So, I guess you're also able to tell that there were many of McGarvey's points that also could be construed as negatives. Probably the biggest is that he is fairly inconsistent when it comes to how to apply biblical silence. He's okay with biblical silence in things like the missionary society and in things like the musical instrument controversy, so long as it's not directly affecting him. But the moment the missionary society denounces the South, he's out. The moment his church begins using musical instrument. He's out. And all this is just simply to say he's fairly inconsistent when it comes to how do I best deal with the idea of biblical silence and letting people hold private opinions. Second, McGarvey's going to set a fairly dangerous standard that will allow Bible college professors to become very, very powerful within the Restoration Movement. And to this day, many Christian churches will say, did you study under X professor when they go to get a job? And this will be a very crucial aspect of the Bible college propaganda. Come to our school, you'll get the correct Bible education, you'll be able to get in with the good conservative churches or liberal churches, if you come from a disciple's background, they use the exact same philosophy, only in reverse. But in all these cases, McGarvey is going to set the standard for the battleground of Christianity and the battleground for the truth will often happen in the collegiate level, which means people who didn't go through such collegiate circles will be kind of on the outside of that discussion, looking in, and often making very uninformed opinions on who they follow, not based on scholarship, but based more on a cult of personality. And lastly, McGarvey is fairly uncritical of his own presuppositions. 
And as such, as even conservatives look back on some of McGarvey's conclusions, they will note that his straight-up grammatical approach to Scripture isn't necessarily the best way to read Scripture. And I find this, of course, fascinating because McGarvey was certainly willing to break over these issues during his lifetime. And now even conservatives would question his conclusions. And so this is all this is just simply to say that people like James W. McGarvey are a part of this ongoing quest to find a a stone to stand on in these twin concerns of unity for Christians and the, an appeal to the Bible as the way of achieving it. And McGarvey will show that even when you are sold out to both ideas, when they seem to come into conflict, frequently we will have to choose one or the other. And for McGarvey, that choice was pretty obvious. He is going to choose the idea of biblical authority over Christian unity. And we see where this leads us. It leads us to a certain amount of division. And that's where we're going to have to leave it for here. And this question of, are these divisions worth it? And I hope that after having come through this class, you will have a way to make an informed opinion about it. So, my friends, I thank you very much for your time. I thank you for listening. I thank you for being attentive as and doing all of your lecture assignments and homework. Have a blessed and productive life, and I hope that I will see you soon. I will talk with you later. Good day, and God bless.